Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Dawson, and today we are talking about a specific mutation in dogs called the MDR1 mutation. And the biggest thing about this specific mutation, and the reason it gets so much press, and why I'm talking about it, is that it has to do with heartworm prevention in dogs. And so I just want to talk about it. This video might get a little bit long because I plan on talking about it more in depth than some of my other videos because really to understand it and understand all the context behind it, you really need to have a little bit more background than maybe some of the other topics that I've talked about. I wanna shout out one of my subscribers and if I pronounce your name wrong, please don't crucify me, but feel free to correct me in the comments. Denny RN, uh, who has a collie and was mentioning this in one of the other videos, my Apical video, which you can find up here, where they had an experience with heartworm prevention in their mixed breed, maybe Collie, maybe Australian Shepherd dog. And so I w did already have this video planned, but it gave me a little bit more food for thought and I decided I'm gonna move it up a little bit in my schedule and really thought this would be relevant based on that conversation. So let's get started here and stick around. It might be a little bit of a long haul through this video, but I think you guys will be well rewarded and well educated at the end. So we'll see you at the end. The MDR1 gene. This is a specific protein and gene that has been known in Collies, Australian Shepherds, and a few others to cause a susceptibility to ivermectin. Now, we'll get into a lot more about this, but the short version really is that this protein causes dogs to be super susceptible to the toxic effects of ivermectin. So why does that happen? Well, in order to really understand that, we need to talk about a couple of things first. Specifically, what is this gene? What does it do? And how does it work? Because before we can really understand why we see these effects, we really need to understand what we're dealing with first. Now, this protein originally was described in literature talking about resistance to chemotherapy agents by in some tumors. So some tumors actually have a resistance to chemotherapy and this gene has, was originally associated with that. So MDR1 actually stands for multi-drug resistant one. So it's a gene that was associated in these cancers with their resistance to multiple drugs. And so there was a lot of interest into what this was. It's a little strange why a gene that was originally found in cancers has to do with ivermectin toxicity and antiparasiticide, but I think you guys will find this interesting. In the literature, this protein has actually been somewhat renamed to multi-drug efflux transporter. So it's a little bit of a longer, a little bit maybe less understandable name, but essentially what it's saying is that it will pump out drugs out of a cell by transporting them across the cell membrane. So here's a picture of a cell membrane right here. Down here at the bottom, you'll see cytoplasm. That's inside of a cell. You'll see a little membrane and that is the cell membrane and then it goes outside of the cell. And so this specific protein's job is to pump things out that don't belong in the cell. And it specifically is looking for specific toxins or other things where they don't belong and pumping them out to where the body can handle them. So for example, with ivermectin, ivermectin is toxic to the nervous system, but the rest of the body, it really doesn't affect. And so it pumps it out of the brain and into the rest of the body to keep the concentration of that drug low within the brain. You can really think of this protein as part of the gatekeeping system. So you can think of the blood-brain barrier as a membrane that prevents blood from entering the nervous system, the central nervous system in the brain. And this goes for animals and in people as well. And the MDR1 protein in its normal state helps to pump things out that don't belong. So basically it cleans the sewer, it cleans it up, and makes sure that the nervous system stays safe. We also find this drug in three other places in the body the liver, the kidneys, and in the intestinal system. It's used to help excrete drugs and foreign substances from the bloodstream into wherever it's being excreted to, so the urinary bladder or back into the GI tract through the bile. Now, in the intestinal tract, it is used to keep things out. 
So this specific protein is one of the reasons why some drugs given orally, you, it's found that you have to give a super, super high dose in order for that drug to be absorbed in quantities that are actually going to be useful. And so a lot of times we end up having to do injections instead of oral, and this is one of the mechanisms by which that happens. This specific protein has been found in most mammals, and this includes dogs, cats, rabbits, humans, mice, rats, everything else. Uh, there's some specific variations on how it works and several different copies and blah, 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 not important. Basically, this specific protein is found in most or all mammals, with the exception of some specific breeds of dogs that have a mutation, which is basically a change, abnormal change in the genetic code that causes this protein to be severely shortened. So instead of it being, say, 2,000 units amino acids long, it's cut down to like one tenth of that size, so 200. Now you have a bunch of protein that you actually need for the protein to function normally. And so this mutation causes the protein to not function at all. Not that it doesn't function just worse, it just doesn't function. And some of these that we usually talk about are collies and Australian shepherds, and I'll go through a whole list here in a minute. But with ivermectin specifically, as this is probably the most well-known drug interaction, it, ivermectin typically in a normal dog, in a normal human, in a normal mammal, has very, very safe safety margins. And what this means is you can give an extremely high dose over therapeutic before you start to see toxic effects. So in the case of dogs, typically we can do 200 times normal dose in a normal dog, and we will still see almost no side effects or very occasional side effects. But with dogs with this MDR1 mutation, the protein, the protein is not functioning as a normal pump to keep drugs out of where they're supposed to be. So ivermectin works as basically a neurotoxin. So for the case of heartworms and other parasites, it basically causes a complete breakdown of their neuronal function and prevents them from being able to move, causing paralysis and actually and eventually death. So in mammals, their bodies are more advanced and they're able to keep things out that aren't supposed to be there. But in a dog with an MDR1 mutation, we have an issue that we run into. And basically the pump is not doing its job. And so even a low dose of ivermectin may cause very toxic signs in a dog with an MDR1 mutation because the pump is not functional. The other place where this is relevant is not just at the blood brain barrier, but it's also affected at the level of the liver. 95% of ivermectin is metabolized through the liver, broken down and changed and then excreted. But if we have this MDR1 pump that's not pumping the drugs where they need to go, it's not only going to be at a lot higher concentration in the brain, but it's going to be there a lot longer because we no longer have normal liver function. So what does this have to do with heartworm prevention? So we know that heartworms are very susceptible to ivermectins. And so some of our heartworm preventions actually are ivermectins or other drugs in this class called the macrocyclic lactone, which is a fancy term for drugs that are related to ivermectin. So one of the more common heartworm preventions that has ivermectin in it is heart guard. The other one would be Iverheart. Um, and there's probably a few other ones. However, we also know, and this is a little bit unfortunate, that with a dog with an MDR1 mutation, not only just higher risk when using ivermectin, but also the rest of our heartworm prevention drugs. And this goes for selamectin, milvomycin, oxime. So one of the problems is Denny RN, the subscriber that I talked about earlier, they had a really bad reaction with their dog because of ivermectin. Now they were able to switch to a different heartworm prevention and avoid the toxic effects that were seen with it. But a lot of people have had this experience where their dog goes through very severe hospitalization, very severe neurologic toxicosis, or even death as uh, unfortunately in a dog that's given too high of a dose of ivermectin, it will eventually cause death, especially when they have this MDR1 mutation. So some people get onto the bandwagon of, well, if there's any risk, I'm just not going to give heartworm prevention. 
And I definitely would not suggest that, especially if you're in the US where heartworms are still pretty prevalent in almost every single state. In places like Minnesota, yes, our risk is a lot lower than places like Florida or Louisiana or Texas, some place like that where heartworms are extremely prevalent. But here in Minnesota, it's not that common, but we still do get cases and I do still recommend using heartworm prevention. So when we give heartworm prevention to our dogs that have an MDR1 mutation, I would maybe avoid ivermectin if you can. However, I would maybe lean a little bit more towards milbomycin than selamectin. And the reason for this is that the safety studies seem to indicate that milbomycin has a lot higher safety margin, even in dogs with the MDR1 mutation. And part of this probably has to do with how likely it is, is that milbomycin binds to these specific receptors in the brain and less to do with the MDR mutation itself. So what are the breeds that tend to be most affected by this? Well, obviously I've mentioned Collies and I've mentioned Australian Shepherds. Other dogs, I'm sorry, I'm gonna read this off a list because there's too many of them for me to count. Collies are kind of your poster child, but long-haired Whippets, Shetland Sheepdogs, Miniature Australian Shepherds, Silken Windhound, McNabs, Australian Shepherds, Waller, and some breeds other than that, like German Shepherds, have a very low percentage of dogs that seem to be affected by this MDR1 mutation. And it is seen in some mixed breeds as well as Denny RN. They said that their dog is most likely an Australian Shepherd or Collie or something in between. They don't really know. So heartworm prevention is probably the most common drug that we worry about for the MDR1 mutation. But this protein also works on many other drugs other than ivermectin, as we already have kind of talked about. Its job is to remove and pump out drugs such as these. Laprinamide, vinblastine, doxyrubicin, pacitrixel, quinidine, ondansetron, cyclosporin, and probably others as well that we don't know about. It's a very important gene and a very important protein for protecting the brain and basically as an integral part of the blood-brain barrier the GI tract, the liver, and the kidney. And so we're gonna be probably continually finding new drugs that are affected by the specific mutation and this specific gene. And so expect that we will probably find other drugs as they come into use that are affected by this mutation. So one of the questions you're probably asking yourself at this point is where did this mutation come from? How did it become so prevalent in these breeds? Well, based on some genetic analysis, which is not perfect, but can at least give us an idea. Most of these breeds that seem to be affected come from lineage where the breed probably originated in Europe, but more specifically in Britain. And so most likely this mutation started there and has been kind of introduced and increased specifically in Collies because of some of the TV shows where there was some irresponsible breeding because the demand for the breed was so high uh, after Lassie and after you know some of these different films. And it tends to be that when Hollywood gets involved, a dog breed kind of goes through the ringer where the demand for it is very high and a lot of irresponsible breeding happens and we get a huge uptick in the amount of problems within that breed. Not that there aren't still good breeders in that pool, but it kind of gets inundated with specific problems based on the type of breed. So all, most of my sources are linked in the description below for all of this information. So if you wanna go read about this with the scientific papers, feel free to go down there. I will also link a few other articles that I think are well written. And even though they may not be scientific literature, they are definitely referencing scientific literature. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys liked this more in-depth analysis of a specific disease and problem, and a, maybe a little bit more long-form content than I have done uh, in recent times, make sure you guys leave a comment down below saying that you like it. Uh, hit the thumbs up and let me know because I'm just trying to figure out here how I want to really format my content because I wanna make sure it's watchable for you guys. I wanna make sure that you guys have the time to go through and watch it, but that you also get all of the answers that you're looking for. So if you guys still have questions or if you have any input, 
on things that you would like to see changed, make sure you leave a comment down below. Have a fantastic rest of your day and we will see you guys in the next video.